The seminar this year had a lot of people from all around the world, and the seminar now takes on a very major role in the international record business. I'm sure that everybody must know by now, maybe it's a little late for some of you to know, that there is a, um, some sort of strange national effort to bring censorship to first the rock and roll industry, then to the video industry, then uh, the National Council of Churches wants to have ratings on normal television programming, and then it'll get to books, and then it'll get to any kind of sign you want to carry around in the street, and then you'll all be wearing the same color clothes, and <laughs> I don't think you're all going to learn how to speak Chinese, but I think that they all want you to sort of worship the same God. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this hearing is on the subject of the content of some, and I want to underscore the word some, not all, rock music. It's outrageous filth, uh, and we've got to do something about it. The outrageous edge of rock and roll has shifted its focus from Elvis's pelvis to the saw protruding from Blackie Lawless's codpiece on a Wasp album. I believe it was you who asked the question of uh, Mrs. Gore whether there was any other indication on the album as to the contents. And I would say that a buzzsaw blade between a guy's legs on the album cover is a good indication that it's not for little Johnny. The problem is that the music might reflect the behavior, attitudes, values of those in the 18 or older bracket. However, when that music is listened to by 12-year-olds, 11-year-olds, and 10-year-olds, it moves from the area of being a, a reinforcer and an encourager into the role of educator. And many of these young children are being educated in these things before they have any kind of frame of reference to properly put it in. As a policy guide for the individual companies. I believe that most people in the United States are smart enough to realize that if a parent does not want their children to hear objectionable material, they have many alternatives. One, don't buy a record at all. Two, shop in the children's section. Get your eight or nine-year-old child a Smurf record or something like that. Three, buy instrumental music. Have you ever thought of letting your children hear jazz or classical music? Voluntarily labeli in, labeling in no way infringes upon First Amendment rights. Labeling is little more than truth and packaging. By now, a time-honored principle in our free enterprise system. And without labeling, parental guidance is virtually impossible. What I suspect is that because rock and roll music reaches so many different people, and it does reach them on a repetitive level, and it does uh, form an important part of their life, if you can control that medium, you are going to be able to control the ideas which go out to those young people. And there are some people who don't want to have young people thinking too much because you've got to keep them really stupid to buy certain products and to vote for certain people. You have the right to write to your congressman, your senator, to the FCC, to the sponsors of all the uh, programs that you like, to your radio station. You can write letters and tell them how you feel about it. It's only made for a market or only made for, for, for money. It's music which comes from the heart and it's music which is fresh. The major record companies view it as the next new hairdo or the next new wardrobe and there's no, seems to be no long-term commitment to anybody's career.